Hey, this is David McCall with the QTS Experience Podcast. I've heard my entire adult life that the purpose of business was to maximize shareholder value, that it, it isn't personal, it's business. Well, my body needs oxygen, food, and water to survive, but that's not its purpose. Its purpose is to help human beings flourish. Devlin Lyles is the president of a leading software development company, and besides his family, his passion is leveraging technology to solve the problems facing business. Devlin dives in deep with me on how we and our businesses can create value in an ethical, noble, and heroic way. It isn't just business. It's personal. On the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data, how we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Devlin Lyles, welcome to the QTS Experience. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Well, uh, one, thank you for um, coming all the way from Houston just to see us. Actually, I think you're here for something else, and uh, I found out and invited you to come onto the show. Yep. In town for an event and decided to join you here and have a conversation. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And the conversation I wanted to have today um, is this idea of conscious capitalism. And so I'm going to let you explain that, but let me tell you how I became acquainted with it. Um, in the circles that I run in, generally speaking, um, we love to sit around and talk about whether it's whatever, political, religion, uh, fun conversations where thankfully we don't divide very often, but we um, will propose solutions or question why we do things, whether it's as a society or fathers or you know, whatever in these uh, different conversations. And over a number of times, a couple of people that I care a lot about that are pretty smart were trying to tell me capitalism has seen its day. I'm like, you're crazy. Why would you why would you say that? And that we need to move into a different form of government. And um, as they laid out their reasons why, um, I, I happened to have a conversation with a mutual friend of ours, Nathaniel. And he said, well, you know, I kind of had that perspective that they had, too, until I was introduced to this idea of conscious capitalism. And um, we got talking about it. I found out that this is something that's near and dear to your heart, that you're involved in this, not just in, um, uh, you know, kind of a, in an esoteric, how you think about it, but you're part of a conscious capitalist um, leadership group or something like that back in Houston. Is that correct? Yep. Like I'm on the board of the Conscious Capitalism Houston chapter, and we're pretty involved in the international movement as well. Right. So I thought, well, I'll just invite somebody on to explain to me what this big idea is and, and get a conversation going. So without further ado, welcome to the show and help me to understand what is this that we're talking about? Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to start by saying I'm a convert. Mm. I spent several years very skeptical Yeah. Um, because it was presented in such a way to me that it was always vilifying capitalism to explain how we could do it better. And that that seemed logically incongruent. It was, okay, but but we're capitalists, right? Conscious capitalists. We can't take apart the capitalism. It's the noun in that. Right. And so it took me a while to understand it. And as I dug deeper into it and I did more research, I am by no means the like deep expert in it, but I came to an understanding that it is the way I've always felt about business, but it doesn't match the public story of it, mm. right? Uh, the public story is that capitalism works because greed, because self-interest, right? Um, a lot of people latch onto that one sentence from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, right? Like, you know, self-interest drives. But the, the interesting part is that that doesn't match at all how I've experienced running a business, mm. right? Running a business successfully is a very simple equation. Not easy, but very simple. Right. I need a product that my customers love, that they're willing to pay for. Right. I need vendors and partners who want me to do better and want to succeed and want to work with me. Mm -hmm. I need employees that show up with their mind, not just their body, not just for a paycheck. Right. And I need a community that I'm a good citizen of so it doesn't get in the way, it doesn't interfere, it doesn't levy taxes, it doesn't get mad about environment, those kind of things. Right. And if I do all of those things well, 
I'll create a long-term successful company. Now, interestingly enough, that kind of roughly structured is conscious capitalism. Hmm. It talks about purpose beyond profit being one of the pillars. Just like you need red blood cells and I need red blood cells, and that's about all I know about bio biology. Uh, <laughs> my purpose in life is not to create red blood cells. I don't wake up and go, I'm breathing in and out, I'm pumping out red blood cells, that's enough. Right. A company needs profit to, to exist. Without it, it's just gone. Right. And the most noble purpose in the world, if it's out of business, does no good. Right. And so conscious capitalism goes, you need to have a purpose beyond profit. Mm -hmm. Like profit's not enough, right? Shareholder premacy has seen its day. Um, and then kind of you go past that and you go, okay, now you need a dedication to culture, right? A conscious culture. You need to kind of seriously engage employees and kind of your other stakeholders and pull them in. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't happen by accident. You're going to need that, mm -hmm. right? That's that employees bringing their mind to the table kind of thing a stakeholder model rather than a shareholder model. What I mean by that is we actually treat the families of our improvers as stakeholders in our business. Their spouses, their children, their friends, their social circles are an important part of our business. They don't work for us. They're not investors, but they are a part of our business because when one of our improvers has a bad day and goes home, is the person that's sitting there going to reinforce, going to go, hey, you work for a good place. They're doing good things. They care about you. Push through. Or are they going to go, yeah, you should totally look for a new job. Like they're a stakeholder in our business, whether we acknowledge it or not. Mm -hmm. And so we need to acknowledge it. Our vendors are a stakeholder in our business because when I sell a training class, mm -hmm. if lunch is late, my customers don't know that that's because the caterer is late. They know it was a bad experience with my company. Right. And so that stakeholder model spreads out very, very kind of broadly. For us, it's a complex mix. It's former clients, industry groups, the communities we operate in, all of that. And so serving a stakeholder model rather than a shareholder model is that third tenant. And the last one is conscious leadership. Now, the way we define that for us is courageous, self-aware, and empathetic. People don't leave their humanity at the door. They're not walking in the door, becoming robots, and then they pick up all their emotional baggage on the way out, right? If they're struggling financially, if they're dealing with, you know, a hurricane or a freeze that knocks out water, you know, things that happen in Houston, teenagers, teenagers divorce, cancer, car wrecks, you know, whatever it is, a flat tire on the way to the office, that's going to show up at work, just like what they do at work is going to show up at home. And so our leaders need to understand that. And we need to approach it, the, the world and our employees that way. And so conscious leadership plays that fourth pillar. And that's it. It's, it's that simple, but very much not easy. I imagine that if you, as you've explained this, if I were to go to most um, organizations for profit, not for profit, they would, they may not, say the word conscious capitalism, they may not know that phrase, but they would probably argue, almost all of them, that's us. Mm -hmm. And I've worked for a lot of not-for-profits and some for-profits, and I've experienced what you've described in um, um, some circumstances, or I've experienced it in groups within an organization. So that leader had that pillar, that, you know, that, that, set of cells within a larger body had that, but not necessarily the entire organization. How, how is it that um, you capture people's imagination that this really is a thing as opposed to, well, let me ask it differently. I, like I said, I think a lot of organizations would say that. I just don't see it executed that well or with, um, they would disagree. So how, how do you create a checklist or how do you persuade the imagination, whether it's leadership or um, an employee or the stakeholders, as you're building up an organization to, to buy into this? Where, where does it start? Does it start at the board? Does it start? Like, I, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to rein in my skeptic gene here that says, sounds great. It sounds like your organization is doing that. But I don't know that that's common in the world. I'm a, I'm a skeptic optimist. <laughs> um, and what is that? A skeptic optimist? Yeah. 
I, I am highly skeptical. I need data. Data moves me in big ways. I was a d data developer back in a previous life. Um, and one of the things that I found is capitalism has the worst PR firm in history. Like it just does. Right. Right. A lot of companies would say, yes, that's us. Right. And we jokingly call them unconscious, conscious capitalists. <laughs> Sleeping conscious capitalists. Right? Exactly. And the thing is that for every Enron, mm -hmm. for every insert ad nauseum, right. you know, scam, greed, corruption, there's tens of thousands of companies doing the right things, honestly trying to produce a good product, take care of their people, and produce value to the world. Mm -hmm. Because capitalism is a system of organization. It's probably based on just data, not a, not a political statement of any kind. Mm -hmm. It's the most effective flat framework for social collaboration the world has ever seen. How, how do you measure that? If, if you say something like that and somebody says defend that position, how do you defend that? Absolutely. So if we go back just the last 2,000-ish years, right? So we go to the BCAD break. Okay. Um, and so we start counting there. Mm -hmm. the, the world's wealth normalized to $2,000. Mm -hmm was roughly 470, 480 million, depending on which, which estimates and adjustments you look at. Now you can go back 10,000 plus more years, roughly that same thing. And it stayed static. And it stayed static and it stayed static. And then there was this inflection point, right around 1750 to 1780. Now in that, three major things happened. Okay. The Industrial Revolution started in England in the 1750s. The wealth of nations, kind of the defining moment for intellectual, ide the ideology of capitalism um, happened in 1776. Same year, democracy kind of burst in with the Declaration of Independence and, and in all of those combined created this idea that, and it was an idea, and it's it's been an idea fraught with problems, and we'll talk about those, I'm sure, but the idea that free markets and free people can solve just about anything. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, if you look at it on a graph, it's exponential. Mm -hmm. Our population had hit kind of the maximum resource load that we could support in any given area. Mm -hmm. And then innovation, because there was financial benefit to the innovators and the ability to change my class structure and all these things that came in with those three combined changes mm -hmm. that are very interconnected. It, it, not to interrupt too much, but it just reminds me when you're, as you're explaining that, I, I'm thinking of, um, you know, natural law and these things that the founding fathers, at least of America, wanted. That those ideas had been around for a very long time. They just couldn't take hold where they were being espoused when they got to our country, um, to America, and the colonies were allowed to just sort of run. Mm -hmm. um, the, I don't know if it was just the DNA of the people that were here because they were the early adopters coming over or whatever the circumstances were, that's where, it, but it feels to me like you had to have that combination of things, but also you had to have a lack of regulation. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm not an anti-regulation. I want the person building my house to, you know, to have inspectors and people looking over their shoulders. I've, I've heard this analogy on Rogan and other places where he was like, look, you don't want no regulation. That's a disaster. So that's not what I'm espousing. But there was less control mechanisms for the market, artificial uh, barriers to overcome more freedom opportunities and um, it just, you know, it just exploded is what it seemed like to me outside looking in. And, and interesting enough, one of the things that was there is that the foundation, right, in that first two to three decades, right, 1770, we'll call it, through 1800, mm -hmm. one of the things that was foundational in it was that there was trust. Mm -hmm. Now, it's an, it's an odd thing I'm going to throw in here, but we trusted that you're going to keep your word. And you're generally going to do what you say you're going to do, that you're going to try and do good. There wasn't trust before that? There was. 
But the the idea that allowed these to flourish that we're struggling with today, mm-hmm. the reason that this all came together is a combination of I trusted that if we made an agreement, mm-hmm. you were going to hold to that agreement. Mm-hmm. Now, there was legal systems and all that, but but that was a baseline assumption. Mm-hmm. Trust in corporations is as, as low as it's ever been, mm-hmm. right? Uh, more people trust the U.S. Congress than they trust big corporations. <laughs> And there's some some great trust surveys around this, right. and it's staggering. Yeah. You know, I saw a thing just on the idea of trust. A very good friend of mine was a congressman in Virginia. He's not anymore. But he said this really interesting phenomenon. Nobody, when you ask them, do they trust Congress? So it would be evidently, in this scenario, worse for business. But nobody trusts Congress. Like it's Its approval rating is less than... Trumps or Bidens or Obama, like any president, like not even close. And yet, almost all of them, 70 to 80 percent approval rating, trust their particular Congress person. And this weird time that we had this conversation was probably four or five years ago. And he said, what that shows you is 95 percent of America, only four to five percent of all the congressional districts are competitive. People have gotten very polarized, so they vote for very polarizing right or left, mm-hmm. very polarizing people to represent them, and they are trusting them to represent this uncompromising, very specific view. They send them to Congress, and the challenge is, whether it's a state house or it's at the federal level, if they cross the aisle to try to find common ground on any of the big culture conversations or um, you know, whatever, they break the trust because they they don't they feel like they're you know you're not right enough for so you gave ground on what I didn't exactly want you right. to give ground on and now you got to go we got to get somebody else in there who will give less ground who will give less ground that's right it's a phenomenon it's kind of scary but anyway and so when you when you pour all this into the the kind of societal moment that those three decades were worldwide. It was this this inflection point. And on the like if you graph income and Raj Sasodia in the book, Conscious Capitalism, actually graphs this. Mm-hmm. And it's an amazing thing. Because over the next 250 years, we go from a roughly stable 500 million-ish in total worldwide wealth mm-hmm. to north of seven trillion. Or yeah, 500, 500 billion, not 500 million, sorry. Right. To north of 7.8 trillion yeah. in 2010. Like that, that that multiplicative effect lifted everybody. Now, did it lift some more than others? Absolutely. Right? I'm not gonna say that it's an equal system. Right. But when 85% of the world mm-hmm. were living in abject poverty, mm-hmm. like the worst racking poverty we can imagine, less than a dollar a day, mm-hmm. right? Children are starving frequently, right. right? That's the world that we're thinking about. Right. And now it's less than 18% mm. in 250 years, right? right? There's a, a, a Muhammad Yaman made a, a comment that I think is achievable, said that um, our grandchildren will have to go to a museum to see what poverty was like. Mm. Like, can you imagine that world? I can imagine it. I, I, I mean. But capitalism has put us on a runway. Like if you just track the trend line right. with no change to the system, right. the trend line gets us there. But it feels like the world's, well, a couple things. One, it seems like the headlines are frequently made up of, if we're going to use the runway analogy, plane crashes. Mm-hmm. And plane crashes, not because uh, we accidentally understood the load on the wings or whatever, but because the pilot left the cockpit, was having a drink with the stewardess, mm-hmm. or the flight attendant, not allowed to say stewardess anymore, the flight attendant, or whatever the circumstance was, you know, Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters was up there flying that sucker, and he, he stopped paying attention. That's what it feels like, um, and what I hear frequently from uh, people that I know is, why don't we try a system that's more quote unquote fair? Or I'm like, where? I don't know. I'm not very educated in this space. I mean, if we're talking bits and bytes and fiber and, you know, whatever, um, uh, electricity and cooling, I, it's more my world. But I, as I look around, and there there have been, and I'm not a history uh, expert, but I, we've seen some of these other governments in play. 
they don't seem to produce anywhere near the value for its citizens. And two, uh, more often than not, there's equal to or greater than misery. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't feel like this is a, oh, look, that team over there. You know, I'm a diehard fan of the uh, Houston Oilers of the 90s, late 80s and 90s. Love you, Blue. Still got my, my wife still laughs at me. Got my little helmet over there. Um, they had a system of the run and shoot with my man Warren Moon and, you know, and crew. And, um, uh, you know, people could look at that system and say it's successful or it's not successful. You know, that's what the defense looks like. That's what the offense looks like. And they can evaluate a system. They can evaluate in sports these systems that people put on the field regularly and, um, and adjust to them. But it seems like when we're talking about something like capitalism or some of the other institutions, the, the, the noise today is we need things to be more fair. We need things to be more distributed. Um, that there are a very few people, perhaps that's the story of capitalism up to this day, but that's an old story mm-hmm. that it's not going to continue in this trajectory, that um, there's going to be a gulf and a separation between the haves and have nots. It's not necessarily my perspective, but that's the noise in the system. So if somebody's having this conversation with you saying, sure, we see this trajectory, mm-hmm. but there's another trajectory that sort of runs with that, and that is the separation of almost creating a caste system in between groups of people. And um, do we just let the market solve that, or, or how does that get solved? Or is that we're looking at the wrong equation that's, in fact, not true? It's, it's a little of all three. And and I'm, I'm not a, like, zero government, no regulation. I do want the regulation in my house, and I want the protections for egregious misuse, and Bernie Madoff should totally be in prison. Like, like those kinds of pieces, right? Like, But then you get into some other things of the problems we see today mm-hmm. are created by yesterday's solutions. Mm-hmm. We didn't have them yesterday, right? In 1995, half of the population of the planet had never made a phone call. Mm. In 95? In 1995, wow. half the population of our planet had never made a phone call. Mm. We, we literally have programs today that give free cell phones to homeless people mm. because it's a, a, a moral right. It's a good. It's a charitable thing. It's a access. It, it breeds equality, all these things. Mm. But we're looking at that and going, we haven't progressed. I'm like, no, no. Just like Warren Moon and the the run and shoot, which by the way, you're speaking Greek to me. I'm a transplant to Houston. <laughs> I was the Oilers weren't there when I moved. Uh-huh. Um, but the the thing with the sports analogy, and I'm going to take it a little further, is we had wins, we had losses, we had statistics. We could look at it and go, they're successful, they're not. Mm-hmm. If you look at the stats, you look at the win and loss ratio only, Mm -hmm. capitalism's massively successful. Mm -hmm. But it's got flaws, right? It's the team planning against the run and shoot and going, all right, we know where they're weak. Mm -hmm. We're going to win next next year by by taking apart that offense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the offense was flawed this season. It means it has to evolve next season. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the idea of conscious capitalism is, okay, with the Flynn effect, right, which basically says that each generation gets 3 to 4% smarter. Right, really, three to four percent per generation, and it's been going on for generations. And when they say smarter, does that mean like I have more knowledge? Mm-hmm. I'm sort of a cyborg by walking around with this smartphone, but I don't, you know, when I was 18 years old and left home, I drove back and forth across the country a number of times with one of those two foot by four foot Rand McNally map books, nope. no GPS, no nothing. I knew the sunset in California where my parents lived. I knew I was leaving Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was going that way. This freeway ended up there. Mm-hmm. My kids can barely get across town without GPS. They don't know the names of any of their roads. So I'm wondering, yeah, they have more knowledge. They have access to more tools. I don't know if they're smarter. So measurable intellect, which is what they talk about with the Flynn effect, is is kind of an intellectual quotient, IQ, those kind of things. The ability to understand and digest complexity hmm. grows generationally. And it doesn't mean that you're smarter. Right. It means your kids are smarter than you are. Hand them an iPad and you'll figure that out. Like I've got I've got three kids and they absorb because of compression effect and a whole bunch of things. They absorb much, much faster because they never had to unlearn some of the lessons we had to unlearn. I suppose that's true. I'll give them sometimes, even though I'm a tech guy for most of my life, 
we get a new technology and we're just this last 18 months switching over to the Apple platform wherever we were anti not picking on Apple but you know we're old school I just PC. ordered a MacBook for yeah. my surface we just you know we're old PC people my kids are all artists or art majors in school so we needed to get on board with the uh, Mac and um, i devices etc I handed them to my then 16, now 18 year old daughter and her older sisters. But then two days, everything's synced, everything's working. And these were not IT people. It was so intuitive to them. I didn't have to unlearn Blackberry, Android, Google Plat, anything. I turned it over to them. So I guess, I don't know if I call that smarter, but certainly they were more efficient with that level of complexity. And, and that's, that's the Flynn effect in, in motion, right? And now the funny thing is that you can see it all across us, all across our society, but three to 4% of generation doesn't sound huge mm -hmm. until you go back a hundred years. And the average person in the United States mm -hmm. is a hundred X better off than they were. They're smarter than 98% of the population a hundred years ago. Like that's the compounding effect, but it means we understand complexity more. Mm. Right. The old you can fool all the people some of the time or right. some of the people all the time right. isn't as true as it used to be because people can understand complexity. The idea of shareholder premacy and capitalism of shareholders maximize value to them. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. I know zero people as an absolute. I know zero people who are single faceted. Mm -hmm. I know zero companies who only serve one end user mm -hmm. who only have one stakeholder. Mm -hmm. And so that idea lacks complexity and needs to evolve to serve the complexity of the world we're in today. We live in the most peaceful time in human history, right? 1914 to 1989-ish was war-torn. Mm. Now it's it's nostalgia mm. to be better, mm -hmm. but we had two world wars, how many smaller wars, we had the apartheid, we had the Berlin Wall, we had all of this. We had Tiananmen Square, we had all of this stuff. And we're, we're ratcheting down on that because as a, as a civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Globally, mm -hmm. we're rejecting more and more violence. Now, the PR side of that is, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. Like clickbait and social media and a lot of the things like amusing ourselves to death is a great book if you haven't read it. Mm -hmm. But those get bigger responses. Mm -hmm. And so you get this kind of distinction between what scientists are telling us and what data is telling us and what we are absorbing through other means. Mm. And that disconnect applies to capitalism as well. The complexities that we're dealing with today is because critics and cynics and the market are telling us to evolve. And it's the greatest gift they can give to a business is to give us feedback and say, you're not doing good enough. Mm. My favorite stories in this, there's a very, very large chemical company that for years, decades was vilified mm. for ruining the environment. Mm. They said, we're going to change. Mm. And they poured in tons of effort and they're like, look, it's going to take decades, but we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And they go to a, one particular factory and they're like, Hey, here are the interim standards. Here are the next steps. Here's where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. I'm like, look, we can't do it. It's an old process, old machinery. It's dirty. Like there's no way to even hit the interim ones. It's not possible. And the answer from the CEO at the time was, okay. But if it's truly not possible, <laughs> if we're choosing between environment and jobs mm -hmm. and profit from this product, mm -hmm. we will choose environment. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks later, the engineers come back and they go, hey, we figured it out <laughs> because that's what like crisis breeds innovation right. and all these things. And he's like, okay, you figured it out and you can meet the end standards, not just the interim ones, the right. end standards. Right. He goes, how much is it going to cost? Expecting some huge number. Right? right. And they go, we're a little ashamed to say it's actually cheaper than what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And we find this in the green movement for chemicals. Mm -hmm. You can actually do better, faster, cheaper, greener mm -hmm. as a business model. That evolution, that money, that additional profit for them and the environmental mm -hmm. was only caused by the critic, mm -hmm. by the person going, you're not doing good enough. Mm -hmm. Conscious capitalism is asking us to get rid of the trade-off. The You can either serve your st shareholders or the environment or the industry or your employees. You can't serve them all. Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, no, we're smart people. Mm -hmm. The world has gotten smarter. The world has gotten more connected. We can solve this. We can do all of them. Now, we might not 
to be able to say, I'm going to do 150 percent in all of them, right? It's a balance and it's a very complex network, but it's harder. And this is where leadership kind of evolves is when we look 60s to today, right? There's this big cultural change in the way we engage with businesses. There's different expectations of businesses. If I took an accounting firm in 1920 and I compared it to any other accounting firm in 1920, organizational structure, processes, procedures, who they hired, all look the same, right? <laughs> right? Which is why M&A was super, like, it wasn't super easy, right? M&A has never been easy, it simple. but it was simpler than it is today. Now you've got cultural integration and you've got all these pieces because those two accounting firms may operate massively different, different value systems, different hiring structures, different organizational frameworks, which wasn't a complexity in 1920, but is today. Right. Our market, our our consumers, our stakeholders are pushing us to solve the problem better, which is a hard thing to hear when you got 50 years of success behind you on the model you're looking at today. Yeah. But BP just announced publicly they're going to net zero carbon. Mm. It's a massive oil company who responded to the market. Some may say too early, some may say too late, but whatever. They responded to the market and said, we hear you. Mm we're moving. Mm -hmm. And they committed to doing it without decreasing earnings to the shareholders. Now that's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. They signed up for a lot of work, but they're responding. Mm -hmm. That's conscious capitalism. It's going, no, no, we get that these are all stakeholders. We're going to serve all of you. We're not going to cut one of you off and say, you don't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like the small towns that, you know, kept trying to block Walmart from coming in, those kind of things. Right. It's like, no, no. How do we serve all of you? Mm -hmm. And, and large companies are slower to move. They always will be. Mm -hmm. Smaller companies are typically faster, which helps to drive the innovation market and those kind of things. But you get this, this push to serve the complexity the world is now able to process because of the Flynn effect. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like the skeptic in me says, so let me, before I say that, I get the big idea. I mean, that, it, as part of my show, <clears throat> first of all, I feel like in my own organization, I've heard my, and this isn't an infomercial for my own organization, but my personal experience has been one of the things that I love the most, and I've been here for a long time, little bitty startup all the way through going public and now going back private. So a lot of changes, a lot of leadership changes. I've had many, many different roles, but one of the most consistent things is at the art current CEO who basically founded the, who not basically founded the organization has been there the whole time, whether he knows it or not would, would fall into that category. I feel like our board as well has always been, um, I, I have a shareholder that I need to serve that are trusting me to bring value to them and they're investing in our organization. I have a customer and this is in no particular order, mm -hmm. in any three order. I have a, I have a customer that is trusting me to deliver in our business 100% of the time. And if I fail in that, they are expecting an honest, tr transparent conversation, an after action report that looks like this, no BS. And what are we gonna do, to, one, to ensure this doesn't ever happen again, and two, to make me whole. How do we do that? And then our third constituency is, how do we take care of our employees? How do we, we call them employees because we don't know the name, but you know, our internal stakeholders, our internal shareholders, how do we create an environment, um, even coming from a skeptical person like me, of love and kindness and improvement and whatever. <clears throat> and so um, we do NPS scores with our customers. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that for 12 years now. Um, anyway, we without knowing it was conscious capitalism, which is what it sounds like to me, that has been um, core tenet on how we have such longevity of people that have been here. Um, we've grown the way we've grown and, and been successful. But it seems like, I don't, we don't have to put a label on it, but that that, that model would be self-evident. And yet, when I look around, even in my own industry, it, it, it doesn't appear to be, um, the normal, uh, it's the marketing spin, but it, when I talk to my colleagues and peers in other organizations, if I've heard one thing, I've heard this a million times, either somebody who's left us, I miss that community, mm -hmm. or 
people that have come in and experienced it said, wow, what a, what a community. Imperfect, because we're human beings, but they've experienced that. So why isn't it, if, if the outcome is an organization that can, can bring the greatest good to those three constituencies, and by extension, if we say those constituencies, we're talking to the world, why isn't it more um, widely embraced? Or why aren't people, other than lip service, flocking to this idea of, I'm going to serve these, dip, these groups wholeheartedly? Partially because we're frustrated, mm. right? We we see the corruption. We see the the outcomes. I do too. Um, the irony in this is I was <clears throat> talking with a friend who is a, a staunch and devout socialist. Mm. Um, and our goals are the same. Mm. Like sure. when we talk about it, yeah. we're both aiming at utopia. Yeah. We're both aiming at a place in which I have meaningful, fulfilling work, right? The the ikigao, right? Uh, ikigai, sorry, um, right? Like the ikigai. It, it, it's the uh, term in Japanese for my purpose, my calling, the work I do to feel fulfilled, mm. right? Now, it's in in American culture we talk about like if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It's right. that construct. Okay. Um, we want purposeful work for everybody, right? Because all the stats tell us that retirement kills people. Like if you retire and don't do anything, life expectancy shortens, right? right? We want purposeful work. We want you to feel valued. That that purposeful work will include challenge. Like it's not just going to be, you know, pina coladas on a beach. Right. And that we want to produce value for our future generations, right? It's that unspoken commandment of of give your children better than you had, right. right? That has kind of governed American culture for years, right? And so we have all of these these cultural pins and we're seeing them we're seeing them kind of eroded, we're seeing them not served. Um, and we're seeing that in pieces, right? You might do two but you don't do three. You might do these three but you don't do those two, right? You you talked about the three constituencies for you guys. Um, but I know that in our previous conversation you talked about the the environmental impact and electricity usage and you guys were looking at that and having to balance it, which means you're actually paying attention to environment. It's a big part of some of those pieces, yeah. right? It is a stakeholder in your business. It is. And, and it's that broader look that the current generation, and by current generation, I mean everybody from, right, late boomers that are that are still in the, the job market to Gen X all the way to Gen Z and whatever the one after that's going to be. Mm-hmm. A, maybe again. We'll come back around. <laughs> um, but, like, all of them are pushing us to serve each of the stakeholders. Now, I am not naive enough to believe that we'll make everybody happy. Right. But what I can say is that business ethics evolves mm. because you have your personal ethic. Mm-hmm. I have my personal ethic. Mm. But when we go into business together and we go to serve a customer and we hire an employee and we work in a community and we live in an environment, mm-hmm. the business ethic is a collaborative construct of those things. Mm-hmm. Our customer gets to define some of the ethics. Mm-hmm. You and I get to define some of those. Our employee gets to define some of those. The community gets to define some. Mm-hmm. And the environment gets to define some. Mm-hmm. And so when we do that, for years, we've been able to find success because we happen to serve most of those. And the ones we didn't serve, society didn't value as much. Mm-hmm. And we look at it and go, how did society not value? We weren't paying attention. Like we went 150 years through atrocities Mm -hmm. that we look back on and go, how could we have allowed this worldwide, right? From slavery to segregation, to apartheid, to child labor, to environmental, to our current problems today. And in all of them, we look back and go, how was this evil tolerated? Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) We're, I'm hoping 40 years from now going to be like, how was the evil of allowing a company that ignored environment and community and its employees tolerated? Mm -hmm. But we're frustrated with that right now and we don't see a path forward. And so the, the system is broken, Mm -hmm. but it's a lot like saying the hammer is broken because you hit the wall instead of the hammer or instead of the nail. It's like, how about we just aim better? Right. Right. Maybe we build a better hammer that guides us to the nail more often. Right. But is the hammer really at fault or was it the people swinging it? You know, go back to your friend, um, giving them the benefit of the doubt that they want better for their children, that they want to be um, 
environmentally conscious, mm-hmm. right? I want to, um, the, though the edges of society that we live in that are on the margins, um, historically that was mentally ill people, children, um, single women, but we can just make it a single parent, mm-hmm. Um, and the elderly, that's generally speaking, um, everybody else has some opportunity uh, to one degree or the other to um, take care of themselves. But if I'm a single parent and I have children that I'm trying to take care of and the costs or whatever that come with that and you know, these other groups, I, I need some kind of a safety net. And they would propose, um, you know, this, the, the experiment, of, experiment of capitalism has worked to here, mm-hmm. but really now, because we're more enlightened or we're more educated or or human nature, you know, you can't trust that small group of usually the way they'll frame it is men, uh, white, whatever, right? But this small group of leaders to behave in the best interests of these constituencies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if we give that power to the state, or if we make it more socialist or we do, which usually means the state, something like that. I don't hear anybody talking about communism, but usually it's some form of socialism or introducing, you know, a semi-capitalist, although I, I don't know how that works, but, a, you know, the semi-capitalist system where these elements are socialized and these elements aren't, but that it's time for that, that, that while we're frustrated with the system, it's because of complexities, because of these, um, uh, the world that we live in, it's now, we're going to be enlightened. It's now time for us to shift from that to this more equitable model. So if mm-hmm. somebody, if your friend's proposing that to you, instead of just saying, hey, look, look at how we've, look at how this system has brought us to here. We need to stay the course and just tweak the things that aren't working as opposed to embracing a whole new system. And they would say, no, 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 that system's dead. We need to go with a new system. How would, how would you respond to that when you think about it? So I, I frame this mentally for me in spiral dynamics. Um, and so spiral dynamics is kind of this idea, the evolution of a value system. Oh, because all I know is that thing where you put the pencil in it and you draw it around the paper. <laughs> yeah. All those, well, that was a spiral sum or other. Um, and so spiral dynamics kind of talks about the evolution of a value system for a society or a, a tribal group or et cetera, and kind of scales up, right. but also for an individual. And that each next step stands on top of the learnings and the values of the previous step, okay. right? And it goes from kind of red, they color everything, right? right. Um, and so you've got like beige, which is basic subsistence. And then you've got purple, which is like mysticism and magic and those kind of things. And then you've got red, which is power, mm-hmm. right? The I have a bigger fist. I can tell you what to do because if not, I'll hit you, mm-hmm. which is the ultimate failing of reason mm-hmm. is force. Right. Right. But we still have red in our society. A, a civilization as a world today, mm-hmm. right? There are warlords who buy guns and use those guns to inflict their opinions on right. their populace that just happen to be near where they bought the guns. Right. Like it's not a great system, but it right. still exists. Right. Now, Interestingly enough, that that red then leads into blue, which is hierarchical, right? It's typically that evolution of is I built power through force or the threat of force and these kind of things. And now I need a hierarchy to maintain, mm-hmm. right? And we see that in the evolution of the Roman Catholic Church in building hierarchy and structure and those kind of things. We see it in military organizations. We see it in the traditional family structure. We even see it in the way that we structure educational systems and college systems and governments. Okay the vast majority are in that blue space when it comes to value system, right? Right. Respect the position, not the person. Right. Is a blue statement, right? It's a, the hierarchy matters. Right. And then beyond that, you get into kind of orange, which is more meritocratous. Now that's where capitalism thrives is merit on top of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Now, as we evolve past that, Mm -hmm. I agree that we need to evolve past it, Mm -hmm. but evolution, not revolution. Mm -hmm. And so conscious capitalism is that evolution to go, okay, based on the excess value that capitalism can create, because the evidence is there, it can create it. Let's create the green system in spiral dynamics terms that says it's more egalitarian. It is more, let's take this extra value and make sure that we do good in the world with it, right? My, our company could absolutely 
make more profit for shareholders at the at the expense of our other stakeholders. Right. We choose not to, mm-hmm. which is choosing green, not orange, mm-hmm. which is the argument for conscious capitalism is let's create egalitarian. Let's create that broader impact and support community groups and support nonprofits and do all of these things that typically were th- philanthropic and consider personal wealth and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But let's do them as a function of running a business. Mm-hmm. Let's do them as a support of our purpose. And when we do that, mm-hmm. We get to that that kind of green state, but we don't destroy the excess value production of capitalism that allows it to exist. Mm-hmm. Margaret Thatcher famously said, right, at some point you run out of other people's money. Mm-hmm. It is if you build the green by destroying orange, you will run out of other people's money. Mm-hmm. But if you build green because of orange, mm-hmm. you can elevate humanity. And so conscious capitalism's kind of credo, their their overarching goal as a movement is the elevation of humanity. Mm -hmm. It is that that same kind of utopic view of where we want to go, but doing so built on a system that is proven to work versus a system that is, with every available piece of data, has been proven to fail. Yeah, I'm not a, um, you know, we'll we'll probably have to get somebody in here that... uh, for the counter argument, I, in my limited sampling of socialist systems in play in the world in a, at a global level or a governmental level, it never worked. You know, I, I just look at human beings and our nature and um, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, we trend certain ways, regardless of how much of how evolved we are. There are certain things wired into our reptile brain. Um, and, uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, with where I was going to go with this though, is what you reminded me of, I meant to ask earlier. So in your scenario, a company, let's say is they take some of the margin that they make and they reinvest it instead of just back into pumping the machine faster for the sake of pumping it faster. Mm-hmm. They reinvest it into other areas of their organization as a conscious capitalist would, and their competitor doesn't. Yep. Their competitor is increasing their profit. Their competitor is increasing. And through whatever the circumstances of the marketplace are, they're able to get ahead and then buy the green company or wage war against the green company, which feels like every Michael Douglas movie ever made. Like, how, you know, they come over and the big giant's going to, or uh, what was it? What am I trying to think of? The... Uh, Charlie Sheen movie, uh, Wall Street, Mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, his dad works for the airline company and, you know, uh, Mike Douglas or whoever is going to come in and buy up and then dismantle his company and all this other stuff. One was for, you know, their uh, customers that flew the planes and for their people who fixed the planes and, you know, and for the marketplace, they're making a profit and they're doing okay. They, They didn't pour everything they had just back into, but it made themselves vulnerable to the other organization that came along and said, ha, we've got them vulnerable. And now that they get them, they're just going to, you know, it's not going to be a new Mm -hmm. conscious capitalist organization. How do you, as you, as you, you know, as you try to lead an organization like that, um, not make yourself vulnerable to market forces that um, uh, say, hey, that's a great, nice story while you're evolving. But at some point, somebody's just going to come along because that is part of the world of capitalism, right? Big organizations come and they buy up as they want to solidify, especially in the world today. Mm-hmm. Uh, Walmart comes into, uh, uh, I saw it happen there in Texas. And I'm an anti-Walmart. I love Walmart. I'm mm-hmm. there all the time. They came in and a number of the hardware stores that had been there for 100 years, they went out of business. In fact, I think Walmart bought a number of them and hired their people and mm-hmm. these things. Those businesses went away and now it was the Walmart way good or bad. It was not the Stanton's way that had been there for 120 years. Um, as you have these conversations, um, and I'm not saying any other form of government would do it better, but this form of capitalism seems to be pretty common. How do you prevent yourself from being vulnerable? Or is that just the, the marketplace is the marketplace? So it's interesting that you bring up the marketplace because I do believe marketplace is the marketplace. Right. However, we choose the marketplace we're in, even as businesses. Mm-hmm. Improving's private. <clears throat> Your company is private. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that is that 
we believe as we believe that you should run a business this way. Sure. And we're not entirely certain that investors in the public market would agree with us. Mm-hmm. And so we stayed, no PE, no venture capital, any of that when we, when we first started for a number of years. Mm-hmm. Um, about 12 years in, we went looking for a private equity partner mm-hmm. who would share those ethos, share that value, share that ethic, mm-hmm. right? And we talked to a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And some of them, it was the gobble, dismantle, integrate. Mm-hmm. And we had to find the one. Mm-hmm. Now, because it's a marketplace, it's a free exchange, right? right? I have to agree to sell, right? It's not a public marketplace where you can just buy up a majority. Right. I have to agree to sell to you privately. Mm-hmm which is the control of the transaction. Right. And so we chose because we wanted to choose somebody that when they looked at the books and they looked at all the finances and we spend 200, $300,000 mm. giving away our space, buying pizza, supporting community groups, literally going open doors. If you want to be here, be here mm. because we want a growing and thriving community mm-hmm. to be a part of. Mm-hmm. We wanted them to look at the books and see that expense and go, Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that required us looking for the conscious PE firms, Mm -hmm. looking for the conscious money. Mm -hmm. It was harder. Conscious capitalism is opting into a harder model, but it has longer legs. Mm -hmm. Using your example, a competitor comes into the space. They don't do that investment. They don't spend that money on community engagement, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Our bet, and it is a bet, Mm -hmm. our bet is that they won't actually be able to succeed past. Because as we invest and as we move forward and we pour money into those stakeholders, it's not done with an expectation of return, Mm -hmm. but return happens. Mm -hmm. The community that we engage with is also the community we recruit from. Mm -hmm. The the communities that we support and we bring out for food drives and all that stuff and movie nights is community we live in. Mm -hmm. And it rallies to support a company that's doing good. The same way it rallies to pick it in front of a company that does bad. Mm. And it's that that double-sided uh, piece of, if you're doing good, engaging the community, that fourth pillar we talked about very early on, it will support, it will protect, it will grow us, and it creates better long-term outcomes. Yeah. I use Whole Foods as a great example. It's the one Raj and, and Mackie use in the book, mm. right? They have a 19 to one salary cap. No one at the company will make more than 19 times the average. Mm. In the typical public company, that's a 400 to one average, mm. right? Salary capped it. They go through all these things, an interconnected mission statement on their website. They, they go through and they tick all the boxes. Mm. The last one is 1800% returns. They outperform the market by massive bounds. Mm. It's no surprise Amazon was like, yeah, we want some of that. Right. But they had to agree to sell. Mm-hmm. They had to sit down and go, how are you going to do this? How are you going to treat our people? How are we going to move forward? And that is a part of that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And it's a part of the ecosystem that takes curation. It takes a lot more work mm-hmm. because um, there's a lot easier ways to make money. There's a lot easier ways to find investment, but they all come with trade-offs. If I want the, if I want the free market's money from investment, mm-hmm. I also have to take their opinion. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not willing to take their opinion on how I should run a business, mm-hmm. I shouldn't take their money. Right. And that's the that's the part of it. It's like this is a free exchange and it's a hard balance. And it's one we don't talk about because it's like a lot of business leaders, a lot of companies are, are, are ashamed to talk about the profit they generate mm-hmm. because they will get vilified for some of those things. And, right. and there's a lot of negative frustration and validly so. Right. I'm proud of the money we make. Right. Because I believe we make that money to the core of my soul. I believe we make that money by producing value and taking care of people, loving on people. And that happens to be through writing software and those kind of things. But it's it's all about loving on people. Every piece of software I've ever touched personally has made somebody's job, somebody's day just a little bit easier. Mm. Well, you know, I love that. It it is. but not all industries, I suppose. So let's say they all have that perspective. Like mm-hmm. that is, they believe in these pillars. They um, uh, up and down the organization from the whatever the founding group is, um, the people that rally around the big idea, 
um, and they get going. But then you're in a capital intense industry, and for mm-hmm. example, in my industry, if I want to, you know, our data centers are two or three hundred megawatts in size. That's a two billion dollar fully realized infrastructure for one. Mm-hmm. I've got twenty six. And so they're not all that size. Some are smaller, some are larger. They don't all serve the same role. Some are core data centers, some are edge data centers, you know, et cetera. If you're going to be in a capital intensive environment and you want to be a conscious capitalist, there are very few places you can go to raise capital. Uh, very few PE firms, uh, if any, that are in the multi billion dollar investment place, right? You have to go to a larger marketplace. And so to a certain degree, you expose yourself to um, the opinion, the whim, the perspective of, of a global um, uh, finance group mm-hmm. that says, uh, you know, I find that the idea of uh, conscious capitalism, while you're profitable and things aren't that bumpy and you're in growth mode, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, hey, do what you're doing, but, you know, whatever, just keep these returns coming. But if it gets lumpy um, and pressure gets comes in, which it inevitably, you know, market changes, things mm-hmm. change, um, they're not so uh, egalitarian. They're not so, um, hey, you do you. Now it's hold on, you know, next shareholder meeting, we're going to have a conversation. Why are you doing this? Um, s- s- what we do, because data centers consume so much power and we consume so much water. Um, we build, uh, in many cases, very large infrastructure. So while we're, we're um, power and, and you know, energy is in our conversation all the time, how we manage water and other consumable finite resources is in our conversation all the time, but also how we build and operate these facilities. And I would argue that if the commodity in the world today is data, mm-hmm. Every album made, it's on in a data center somewhere. Your software code is it's on some mm-hmm. server saved to a cloud or somewhere, which is just a computer in someone else's data center. Uh, so that makes data centers pretty uh, valuable, if not some of the most valuable real estate on earth. So how are you protecting? Like all of these things mm-hmm. come into play. Without going to either the some of the largest PEs in the world or the marketplace, we're not going to be able to fund that stuff. And then the other thing that we we found that we need to do as we've been managing through the environmental and social part of the world, that's evolved in our world, these pillars, is how do we put governance around it? How do we demonstrate what we're declaring we're doing, we're doing? Now, we've, we've got that for our accounting books. We've got that for, um, you know, our things that are very easy to measure metrics on, the power we consume, our efficiency levels, things like that. But that's, I guess that's a two-edged question to you, which is one, um, how do conscious capitalists bring governance um, into their world to make sure they can demonstrate to the world what we say we're doing, we're doing with any and all of these pillars. And the second is, if you're in a capital intense business, I don't, it, it almost seems like in the way that you've laid the conversation out to this point, if you keep it small or if you, maybe small is the wrong word, but you keep it private and you, and you get some of these investment partners, you have a lot of control. Mm-hmm. And so you can make sure that, um, or you can do your best to ensure that everybody from the financiers all the way down to the newest hire in your organization is in general on board with our big idea and how we treat each other, what products we make, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But that's going to, by necessity, limit you to a particular size. How do you grow beyond that? So two things, governance and growth, I guess. Absolutely. So the ESG movement is is part of the market criticism I was talking about earlier, pushing us to do a better job. Okay. And... And we should welcome this, right? The, the, comp- the conscious capitalism space is going, hey, there's an underserved stakeholder. We need to we need to figure out how to roll that into the model. 
and there's complexity to that, but like, it's not an anti-governance thing, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's actually a certifying group for like B Corps that, that looks at, are you, are you hitting all the pieces and certifies that that's happening, yeah. right? The, the empiricism, the hard conversations is part of that conscious leadership. Um, but one of the books that's kind of foundational in this movement is called Firms of Endearment, mm -hmm. right? And this is where they don't, they don't have to buy into the ideology to invest in the company. Because a conscious capitalism company that does all these things, the market has said is much more valuable. Mm. Even if the market doesn't actually value the things the company values, the performance they do. Mm -hmm. So if I look at firms of endearment, I wrote it down so I didn't misquote this for you, is 1,646% above market performance. Oh, wow. So outperformed the market by 16 and a half X mm -hmm. over a 10 year span mm -hmm. that increased in the five years afterwards that included a whole bunch of things from 2015 to 2021. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that differentiation, conscious capitalism businesses are not a get in early, squeeze all the value out, tear it all apart, get my money now and exit. Mm -hmm. They're building for sustainability. The market loves that consistency of returns and performance will maintain even through the bumpy, mm -hmm. which is ironic because it's the opposite of the story we hear, mm -hmm. right? To sustain through the bumpy, you've got to, you got to do these, these things and nobody's happy about them, but you got to do them. Right. That's, that's actually the counter to what we see is that the performance, the sustainability, the ability to serve all the stakeholders, even in the hard times mm -hmm. is higher in a conscious capitalism business than it is in a normal one. Now, that's not to say it's easy, right? We went through COVID just like everybody else did. And we saw a massive reduction in sales and those kind of things. And we had, I want to say it was a little over 80. I don't remember the exact number of folks who volunteered salary cuts mm -hmm. to make sure we could save as many jobs as possible. Mm -hmm. Part of that conscious culture and being bought into that vision. And as we were able to progress, we were able to recover and come out of it faster than a lot of other folks. And we were able to give them all back in under six months. And then we bonus back every dollar they loaned us because effectively by taking a voluntary salary reduction, they loaned us some money. We bonused it all back for all of our consultants at the end of the year. Like we were able to survive that not because we ratcheted down on all of our support for community and how much we cared on people. And um, like we were delivering barbecue on Sundays to make sure that everybody had some like, hey, you've been having a hard time of this. We're all going through this together. Here's a dinner for your family. Just make sure that you guys can spend some time because it's rough. Right. Right. Um, it was the whole, you know, it's not work from home. It's work from crisis. Right. And there's mental health pieces to that. And we leaned in on all of that. So some of that spending actually went up through this for us, right. but it sustained better. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at good to great, um, the companies that were picked solely on financial performance, you're talking about the book. Good yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you look at the companies from good to great picked solely on the financial performance, firms of endearment, the ones that operated in this model of conscious capitalism, con conscious capitalism outperformed them 12 X. Wow. And so, it is financially better for people to run businesses this way, which is why I believe capitalism will win the argument is because that when you do it well, right. And there have been well-run, you know, capitalist companies all the way back to the 1700s that did the right things. They didn't need a government to tell them how they didn't need people in the market to force them. They just chose to, they, those have existed for hundreds of years. And they'll continue to exist. And we'll see regulation pull the late adopters and the laggards along with us, the ones who won't go that way unless forced. Mm -hmm. That will happen. Mm -hmm. Conscious capitalism is going, hey, this is where it's going. This is in everybody's benefit, including yours as an investor, as an owner, as an operator. Mm -hmm. Let's go that way. Because the data shows very clearly this is a better way to performance, happier employees, better longevity. Like if we can tick all the boxes with a little more hard work, why wouldn't we tick all the boxes? Yeah, no, I, look, <laughs> I, um, that's why I thought this was a fascinating conversation. One, I wanted to get educated, but two, one of the biggest challenges that we have as an organization and any organization that I've been in, but seems to be, um, one of the most prevalent conversations today is um, not that organizations 
I'm thinking of a number of people that come here on the show and had conversations with me that not that they don't know um, intuitively some of the things that you've talked about today, but they, they just can't either find or retain talent. Mm -hmm. And we have been pretty successful in retaining, anyway, probably the highest in our industry. I don't have an empirical mm -hmm. way to demonstrate that, but that my spidey sense tells me that. And we've, I personally, in the organizations that I've led within this organization, <clears throat> I've had people come back because they went and they experienced the culture. It was closer, it was more money, it was these other things. And a few months in, they realized, um, this isn't working for me. I had a friend of mine who was a um, uh, former ranger, so of course I'm paying attention to him, and a, a pastor of a little church down in Galveston, Galveston Bible Church. He's a retired chaplain now for the military, but um, he he and I were talking one day, and he said, you know, um, because of where they his church was, they had um, physicians come and go there at the University of Texas Medical Branch, which is where I worked down in Galveston. And... <clears throat> One of the things I was asking for some advice on some stuff, and he said, you know, I would not underestimate the value of community, which is not what I thought he was going to say. I was going to talk about something else. And he said, human beings are meant to be in a community, and in a community, it, it can vary per person or per group, but, but satisfies these things and brings value in these things and... Um, gives them the opportunity to give value back to the community. And so we've seen people leave our organization, or I've heard the story where they've left an organization that they loved for a temporary benefit. And they came back because they were like, wow, I'd rather have the community. Now, you gotta be able to pay your bills. You gotta, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta be able to do those other things. But to be in a community where I feel like my organization is making a difference for me and my neighbors, um, the team that I'm working with, and I feel like I'm making a difference within that team and I'm able to bring value. And I feel like we adjust as we, as we, as an organization come across things that are, you know what, maybe we're not diverse in the way that we thought we were. It's more out of uh, naivety and ignorance than it is uh, this idea of being um, uh, wicked or oppressive or whatever. It's like, wow, I, I guess I never really had that perspective. And as I get the data that helps me to change my mind, I have the courage to change my mind. And so it seems to me that people, organizations would want to adopt this philosophy if they're, if one of the hardest things for us to attract is talent and then to retain real talent, um, that this would be a, you know, Captain Obvious moment, behave like this, not just how you're performing in the marketplace. It's... <laughs> It's a hard balance, right? We see massively lower than industry standard attrition mm -hmm. um, in kind of kind of all markets, ups and downs and all that. Mm -hmm. And while we're seeing more now, we're definitely not seeing the numbers that you see on LinkedIn and those kind of things. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that I, I find interesting in this is cynicism and baggage happen. Mm -hmm. I know when we hire somebody for the first three, four, 12 months, mm -hmm. I'm going to be measured against their previous boss, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to be measured against their previous CEO or their previous president, not because of anything I've done, mm -hmm. but because they're looking for the hallmarks that they left mm -hmm. because a lot of places will throw money at culture. And it's the first thing to vanish in the hard times. You talked about it, yeah. right? A lot of people will go, yep, this is all lip service. We have values. Hold on. There's a card in my wallet somewhere. I can tell you what they are. Right. Right. Open offices, pool table, beer kegs, all those things right. are easy to buy in good times. Right. And so it's, it's hard at the surface level to understand the difference. And it's also hard to quantify it. Mm -hmm. I was having this conversation actually last night. It went into almost two in the morning um, with a group of improvers that were sitting there just talking. And we were talking about the fact that, like, I've been offered a job and several of them have too for massively more in base salary. Mm -hmm. But they can never come close to matching the other things I have. Mm -hmm. I'm a better husband mm -hmm. and a better father because of the investment that people have made at improving in me. Not, not in business, not in understanding finance, but in teaching me tools that I can use to build trusted, deepening relationships with my children. Mm -hmm for kicking me out of a client to make sure I spent a long weekend with my wife because I was working too much. Mm -hmm. our, our chief acquisitions officer, Rick, mm -hmm. kicked me out of a client that was in crisis. When I've already talked to the client. Your access is being shut off. 
go spend a long weekend with your wife. You're working a lot and we appreciate it, mm-hmm. but your family's important too. Mm-hmm. It's those things mm-hmm. that don't come across in salary. And it's not, unfortunately, it's been used by a lot of companies as an excuse. It's like, well, we've got a great culture. We'll pay 40% less. Right. That's not what it is. It is a, I have a market competitive salary. I have a market competitive you know, structure to my compensation. And I get these things because the value of dollars changes by the method they're delivered. Mm-hmm. We've got some folks in which if I give them $1,000 a year to attend any training they want to attend, that is worth more than 10 grand in bonuses because money's not their motivator. Growth is their motivator. Mm-hmm. I've got some folks whose travel and experiences is their motivator. So $1,000 travel deal to Mount Kilimanjaro or wherever, that's that's their game. Mm-hmm. And the it's I equate it to having children and going, I can either find out what they're interested in and find the gift that really speaks to them that they're going to love, or I can give them a gift card. Mm-hmm. There's a different level to that. Mm-hmm. And employment is the same thing. The number of times that I get, oh, here's cash. It's like, no, but I get experiences and I get growth and I get personal coaching and I get feedback and I get the things that I thrive on, the things that I look at and go worth more than its weight in gold. Because the person on the other side took the time to understand me, to care about me, to know how I receive love mm. and to give it. Mm-hmm. It's a different ball game. And which means ultimately that the dollar for dollar base salary comparison is invalid. It doesn't take in all the variables. Mm-hmm. And we've had folks that leave, they boomerang, they come back and they go, I didn't know I was going to miss these things and they weren't worth it. And that happens often. Right. Now, the funny thing is in the fullness of time, the the comp typically accelerates Mm -hmm. because we still, to this day, grant equity, even though we've got a PE partner and all that, they've been incredibly good for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trinity Hunt is the, the partnership, the PE firm incredibly good for us in this because we continue to grant equity out to our high performers internally and and give them the opportunity to reap the benefit of our collective effort. Even though we're private, Mm -hmm. that is a continued process of our culture. I didn't join the company as a founder. I joined a few years in Mm -hmm. and grew to there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's because we're trying to serve those disparate stakeholders, but serve them in the way they need to be served. Mm that is congruent with our business model, right? Like we could give away a ton of money and those kind of things, but then we go to business, but like we support community groups. We've got a, a coding camp that meets in the, our Houston office. We've got 20 some odd user groups that we support out of different offices and these kind of things. It's, we speak, we do blogs, all these things because we want to support the community mm-hmm. that will someday make a benefit for us. Maybe, mm-hmm. But even if it didn't, we'd still do it. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's there's a kind of a, a time value to money thing mm-hmm. that we don't talk about. Mm-hmm. We boil capitalism, we boil comp down to money. Mm-hmm. And people aren't single faceted, mm-hmm. right? Like I have some folks that if I give them a bonus, they're like, eh. and that ambivalence is actually a negative. Like I could have done a hundred things that have, that have appreciated more for the same dollars. I'm not arguing for spending less. Right. I'm arguing for actually caring that we retain the person, mm-hmm. not the position, not the random number in a seat, right. but Joe, mm-hmm. what does Joe love? What does Joe care about? What does Joe need? Mm-hmm. Let's fill that. Mm-hmm. That's a harder thing. And it's, it's a style of leadership that is kind of antithetical to the way we structured business from 1940 to 1970-ish. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take a while for that to change because the folks who grew up through that, mm-hmm. right, straight out of college in the 60s and into middle management in the 70s and 80s and are now senior executives and leading organizations, founded organizations, they've built a career of success on a model that differs from that. Mm-hmm. And the best of them have evolved with the market. Mm. And the worst of them haven't, but are still successful. <laughs> well, as you're describing, I, you know, I, I spent time in the military, and it was a pretty lumpy time. My last nine months to a year were pretty successful for me. My first two years, not so much. Um, one of the things I learned uh, pretty early on is sergeants don't like their privates to say, "Well, why? Why are we doing that? That seems like a dumb idea." <clears throat> so while I joined the military to escape authority, it, it was that uh, my sergeants believed in wall-to-wall counseling, <laughs> as, they, as they expressed it. But 
I guess my question, so when I got to a different leader that um, recognized my spectacular immaturity and how I was processing the world, <clears throat> my previous experiences weren't necessarily my NCO's fault. It was, I was a pretty immature person that showed up with a whole bunch of baggage. When I got with the right leader, um, my whole world changed. My experience changed. My attitude changed. Um, as I think about my time in corporate world as a single contributor and as a leader, um, my teams reflected a lot of um, not just their uh, aptitude. You know, they, they had certain intellectual ability that they were recruited in for, and we maintained that. But their attitude really was a direct reflection of me. How, how did I treat them? How did I manage them? And I managed them very differently, depending upon, just like kids, depending upon what drove them, et cetera. I also noticed that in the organizations that I'm thinking of, there wasn't a lot of emphasis in leadership training to train people um, to find leaders either one that could learn how to, how do you figure out your people? Either it was too much time or not valuable or whatever it is. Um, sometimes we promoted people that had great technical skills, great personalities, mm -hmm. and put them in a leadership position. That was not a good situation for them. And other people that we didn't put into leadership position because they weren't technical enough or whatever, but come to find out they were spectacular leaders. Okay, managers, but really good uh, leaders. How do you imagine in this world of conscious capitalism that you're going to, because it seems like in order for it to work, in order, in order for the United States Army to really work, it's built on the shoulders of our non-commissioned officer corps. Mm -hmm. We've got great officers. We've got great command and control. But we have this cadre of professional soldiers, not counting the outliers that we hear in the news mm -hmm. sometimes of things going wrong. But overwhelmingly, they are, they are trained well. They're peer-reviewed. There are things that they're taught on... Um, leadership and courage and problem solving and communication and over and over and over. And by and large, those that don't do well are weeded out or they're, you know, you, you only progress so far once you get to a certain ability. How in this model that you're describing, uh, not just for your organization, but as you speak to the broader, you know, you're, you're on the board there in Houston and you're helping to persuade other business leaders, how do you develop a program to build those junior leaders who can become senior leaders because you know you can't be the person that's speaking to everybody up in your up and down your organization so how do you do that so it's a great question right it's one of the reasons it's a long-winded question but it's <laughs> but it is one of the reasons that conscious leadership is one of the four pillars is that it is critical to the success of that system mm -hmm. right people don't quit jobs they quit managers and we've all heard the same things but when it comes to building that that structure, the world needs leaders and the world needs managers. And for years, we've been using those terms interchangeably in business. Mm -hmm. They're not. No. They are unique skill sets that have immense value, but rarely will you find somebody that is amazing, like level five in both. Right. Right. You'll find some that are like level three and level five, you know, whichever way they tilt. Right. And you typically find those amongst senior executives because it requires that kind of ability to dynamically move between project management, problem solving, et cetera, and gravitas and attraction and attitude and magnetism. Right. And those are very, very different things. But at the core for, for us and for, kind of the, the tenant, self-aware and courageous and empathetic. So we aim at teaching that. For us, we teach steady resilience. Steady resilience being the ability to weather a storm, right? Now, back in the Jack Walsh days, CEOs were like these titans, right? They could cast down profits from on high. Yeah. <laughs> But then crisis after crisis, after stigma, after crisis, after, you know, corruption scandal created this. We want 
the calm and the storm culturally. And so the, the role of CEO changed. Mm. The personas we were looking for changed, mm. right? You didn't want the, the roughiest roughneck leading the rig team. Mm. You wanted somebody that was going to keep everybody emotionally kind of there because they're spending two weeks away from their family. Mm. You didn't want the, the most gung-ho of the gung-ho. Mm -hmm. You wanted the person who was going to pay attention to, hey, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's one of my favorite scenes in Remember the Titans. He goes, you got a bad attitude. He goes, attitude reflects leadership. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and it's, it's that piece of it, right? And so culturally, we've shifted this. And not every organization is caught up with it, which is why you see these kind of differing success rates and attrition rates and those kind of things is we're finding the edges and we're finding it through data. Now, that data is – I'm not trying to devalue. That data is human beings who are struggling. Mm -hmm. That's rough. But at a societal level, we're finding those edges. Mm -hmm. We're finding the managers who can't make the switch. Mm -hmm. We're finding the leaders who can't make the switch. Mm -hmm. And that's going to drive the right behavior because the ones that succeed – and we've got a lot of different data. There's a, a, uh, a great study by Kenger and Freeman. Mm -hmm. So they kind of quantified – uh, leaders into exceptional, great, good, I think mediocre and bad. Um, and great leaders outperform the midline by 3x. Mm. Exceptional leaders outperform all of the rest plus some. Mm. Now, when I say outperform, their companies or divisions mm -hmm. have significantly better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so leadership is a defining, you know, kind of differentiator for companies. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we start at that base level, like just courage and self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? Because you have what we call acquired learning, mm -hmm. right? Or horizontal learning. It's new skills. It's, hey, how do I rack that new type of server? Or, you know, how do I learn VMware's uh, APIs? Or how do I learn that new programming language? Or how to dig a ditch? You know, whatever it is. Um, but then you have vertical learning or what we call adaptive, mm -hmm. which is how do you learn to question your worldview? Mm -hmm. How do you learn to be truly curious to things you disagree with? How do you learn to question your emotional state that you're bringing to a critical conversation, mm -hmm. right? Those sacred conversations that are formative in somebody's life, formative in their career. Mm -hmm. How do you respect those such that you're not going to taint them? You're not going to destroy them. You're not going to, by trying to talk them out of their emotions mm -hmm. or argue them out of their opinions, mm -hmm. you're going to push them away. Mm -hmm. I've never found somebody that was argued into faith, right? Yeah. They have to be met where they're at. Right. And, and so we teach those, those three basic things. Mm -hmm. And for the few that, that can internalize them, it's then intentional, deliberate, and consistent. We ask an hour a week minimum of personal growth mm -hmm. as a part of the work week, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're a software so company. What would that look like? So they, they what, on their own, it's a self-study or is it part of a program? So we, we do a, a coaching program and every 90 days you put together, here are the goals of the things that I want to be working on. For some folks, it's creative writing. Mm -hmm. And so we pair those goals up with improving goals. Mm -hmm. We go, all right, here's the overlap where you can do both, mm -hmm. right? Porque no los dos. <laughs> but it's the, you know, hey, let's do both at the same time. You want to you wanna practice creative writing. Mm -hmm. We're writing a bunch of blogs. Let's, let's tie that together. Or we're going to be doing this technical initiative for some, some marketing material and sales material internally. Can you put some sizzle to it? Tell a great story, write a case study, mm -hmm. but they get their goal is to ultimately write a novel. I'm using one kind of unnamed person in particular. And our goal is to get those initiatives done. Mm -hmm. If we can do both, if we can get to both endpoints, mm -hmm. right? We're eliminating the trade-off just like the chemical company. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And so we do that every 90 days with everybody. Mm -hmm. And it creates this virtuous cycle because everybody's constantly getting better. Mm -hmm. Everybody's constantly investing and growing towards their goals and towards ours. Mm -hmm. And we've codified this into a system where we actually measure ownership behavior this way. Because mm -hmm. all you have to do is go, hey, I was working on open source software development or coaching somebody else or collaborating or personal study or whatever. And they're all worth points. And those points become bonuses and year-end profit share and all those things. Mm -hmm. To incentivize the behavior that brings advantage to them and advantage to us, that serves both stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And by creating those systems that are 
consistent and deliberate, what we have found is that very much like um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, he talks about the the Sky Cycling Team, mm. right? They bring in a new coach, and he does all the normal things. Um, he brings in new gear and they new bikes, and they are a little lighter and all that. But then they start tailoring the. Um, the sleep schedules and they test out different pillows and mattresses to see who recovers better and different mixtures with each different rider to make sure they recover better and effectively said, we're going to try and get 1% better in each of these little pieces because the compounding effect of marginal gain, if I get 1% better every day, doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm 27 times better at the end of the year. Okay. That sounds like a lot. 1% better every day is hard. Right. All right. What about 1% better every week? It's like, okay, I'm still 3x better by the end of the year. Like, it's just like compounding interest, but applied to a human being. When do you, though, who was the guy that won all the um, gold medals in swimming? Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. Who did he beat? Everybody. Yeah. We, we remember who he beat. I remember seeing um, a, a story, a study, or whatever. His, his average length of winning. And I thought, well, it's you know, probably a body length. Of, well, no, it's a little bit bigger than a butterfly wing, but it was a whisker in many, many cases. So when you talk about incremental growth, in, in the thing that I read or heard, <clears throat> his coach said, look, there are minimum requirements, and I'm sure I'm gonna get it wrong, but from how you dive, into, you know, you hit the water, your stroke technique, your breathing technique, your, you know, your ability, what, all these things. Let's just say there's 10 things. <clears throat> I'm not going to try to get you to incrementally improve all 10 in this conversation by 1%. Have a, we have a minimum standard. We're going to work on getting you to the minimum standard of all those things. But in two of these things, you are world class. <clears throat> People are not going to pay me to be a little bit better speller. They will pay me if I am the best in the world at this particular thing, which when I add the sum of this means I win more gold medals than mm -hmm. everybody. So I'm curious in your paradigm, we have incremental improvement across a, a broad spectrum of things, but is there some point you get to where, okay, that's enough. I'd rather you get 1% better in a spot where you're 99.98% better than the rest of the world because that 1% wins the gold medal, mm -hmm. getting, spending the same amount of time to get a little bit better in spelling or whatever it is in this other thing. How do you, how do you think through that or manage that? So we, we conceptualize this using uh, strength finders for us, right? And we talk about strengths. We talk about aspirational strengths mm -hmm. and we talk about weaknesses. Okay. I don't want you to turn a weakness into a strength. Very, very, very few people on earth can ever do that. Right. Take something that is truly a weakness and make it a true strength. I want you to eliminate the Achilles heel. Once you've done that, the minimum bar of competence, stop. Right. Just stop. Right. It's going to be emotionally draining. It's going to be painful. It's not going to align with your ambitions, right. your goals, et cetera. But once you've eliminated strengths, which is, we typically see that as about 20% of your growth time, right? Spend the rest in reinforcing strengths and growing a new aspiration, like one of your aspirational strengths, which is why that coaching, right? Because you're typically going to work on one or two things a quarter. My one or two things a quarter, which because I'm horribly overambitious and commit to way too many things is like three or four personally, because I do this program with our CEO. Um, my one, you know, two or three things, four things uh, <laughs> are typically kind of oscillating, right? I have some that are kind of standard, they're foundational, right? Health and spirituality for me. But then I have the, all right, I want to get better at responsiveness. Right now, I want to get better at actively listening and approaching with curiosity. I have sometimes a hard time with, with knowing. I memorize a lot of stats, I study pretty heavily, and that's how I relate to the world. But oftentimes it stops me from listening for what the person's feeling behind what they're saying, right? Because they're like, well, here's this thing. I'm like, does it bother you? The data doesn't match your perceptions. Like, but what they're saying is that there, there's emotion there. There's frustration there. And I just dismissed that. I went, it's illogical. Go away. Right. I dismissed over half the person because fears aren't rational. Right. Anxieties aren't rational. Right. 
and and that's my current struggle. So this quarter, that's what I'm working on. A little overshare, but it's all about being real. What I find is not in all conversations, but the conversations where if we're talking motocross, if we're talking data centers, if we're talking my new passion, Frisbee golf, um, if we're talking some of these other things or, or things of faith of certain scriptures, first hesitations is one of my favorite, but things like that. I have things memorized and what happens for me is I'm waiting to lay down my statistic to thwart your common argument instead of really listening, knowing that I can recall it or I can look down and get it if I need it. So I have a tendency to have these things sort of stacked up because I know how the, I have a, an idea of how the discussion is going to go. And I will also tune out. Mm-hmm. I will be thinking of other things. So I'm, I'm just waiting for my call to lay it out or, or whatever. I'm, I'm, you know, my ADD kicks in and I'm running at 15 things at the same time. So in, I'm curious for you, as you work on it this last quarter, is it something you're reading? Is it something that, how do you actively um, train your mind to get better at that? So it's, it's a, it's a, complex series of interactions. Uh, unfortunately, I wish it was simple. I wish there was a golden answer. Um, but what I have found is I'm looking, I'm looking to shorten the cycle from, I made a mistake to, I know I made a mistake because for a long time, that was months. I would hear sideways feedback months later of, I came off as a jerk in that conversation because they didn't feel listened to. They just felt ran over, right? I worked with a team of folks and we were trying to solve a big problem. Two years later, I was having a conversation with one of the team members that, yeah, I kind of hated you for a long time. And then I realized you have a good heart and I forgave you. I'm like, I am so terribly sorry. And it, it, and I wish that was a joke or like a a made up thing. It's not. Ken sat down with me and went like, here it is. Um, and so I'm trying to shorten that cycle. And so we've got a template we call performance journaling, right? What happened? What was I feeling? What was I thinking? What did I do? Right. Using the, the victim triangle language. And then what do I want to happen next time? Our brains are incredibly powerful pattern matchers. Mm -hmm. And so what do I want to happen next time? Becomes my brain will trip that in the middle of a conversation going, whoa. You said next time right. you want to do this. And typically I still make the mistake, right? But as that trigger gets more ingrained, right? I, I'm using atomic habits because I use it to hack myself often, right? I associate a trigger in a conversation. Like when somebody else is talking, making eye contact, mm-hmm. making sure to slow down and breathe, mm-hmm. right? Cause I, I can tell when I'm waiting to talk rather than listening because I'm typically like leaning forward. I'm breathing in. I'm like getting amped, right? Um, Just because, oh, the knowledge that's coming, right? And I'll slow down. I'll sit back a little. Like it's physical cues for me when I'm getting emotional in a meeting because somebody's frustrating the snot out of me. My my palm gets sweaty. My heartbeat races. I typically lean back, but like flex, right? right? Tighten up, ready for the attack. Right. Take a deep breath, sit forward. So for me, it's physical cues that then I can change behavior. What I'm looking for is to take it from six months in the past Mm -hmm. to three seconds in the future. Mm -hmm. That's all I want is three seconds to make a different choice Mm -hmm. because with choice comes responsibility, but with awareness comes choice. Mm -hmm. And if I build the awareness, I can get to choice. Then then I'm on the hook for the, did I make the right choice? And so that framework was taught to me. I didn't, I didn't have this before. That's one of the things I said, I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. That was taught to me where I am today. And we, we do a lot of this internally, but there are some great companies who do this and do this very, very well. Like, uh, Stegen learning is one of them. Rand Stegen, big in the conscious capitalism space helps instill these types of programs and companies to teach their leaders to go, no, no, let's, let's talk about emotional intelligence. Let's talk about conscious communication. Let's talk about crucial conversations Mm -hmm. so that you can get better at managing yourself. Because until you can do that, managing others is fraught with landmines. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, as you were explaining that, it reminded me of, we have, um, we're recording in the studio here in a week or two, a professor out of MIT, our second one, very excited. Her name is Christine uh, Chase, and she is, um, among other things, 
responsible for, she does data analytics there, sports lab, esports, um, game theory, I believe, a number of things. One of the things that part of her conversation she talks about in that evolving world is wearables, wearables for athletes, all, all these really interesting things. I'm imagining at some point, my a buddy of mine who just retired at the CEO at Accenture, <clears throat> Uh, of their digital division. He's gone on to do some other stuff. One of the cool things he's working on doing is getting plastic out of the ocean. So I, I'm all about that. But he also talked about, he's helped to fund and really curious about wearables for people of a certain age mm -hmm. that don't want, that can't afford somebody to live in their home, but they can live in a community and they want technology to help not invade their privacy, but if they get into a situation that is unsafe for them, you don't have to wait for somebody to call a phone or mm -hmm. come in the next day, right? So you're talking, I'm wondering if at some point we don't have some kind of wearable. You know, Tim Cook over at Apple said, look, if in 20 years you don't think of us as a healthcare company, we fail. Whether it's your watch, it's your whatever that says, that's evaluating, hey, your respiration is doing this, you're, you're breathing. I hold my breath all the time. And I'll, I'll know that because I'll, all of a sudden they're like starting to lose my breath and I'll have to, and I tune out of the conversation for a second because like, why are you, why are you holding breath? Well, because I'm eager or I'm anxious or <sighs> breathe, relax, lean back, pay attention. And I have that gap of 10 seconds or so to kind of reset myself. I'm, I'm imagining you were talking about before about how um, the people that come after us do that three to 4% better at complex systems as we evolve tools and develop tools to help us and then hopefully tune them to ourselves. What is it that I want this tool? Of course, a skeptic in me says, yeah, and then they get that data, <laughs> get whatever, but let's just keep it nice, <laughs> not iRobot uh, space. But I can use it to help me, um, not to be a fake human being, but to be a more aware. I love what you said there about being aware. You know, it's, um, just had this conversation with, uh, with one of my daughters about consequences. She wasn't in trouble with mm -hmm. conversation about consequences. So generally speaking, I, and since I believe there's a higher power, we that higher power holds human beings, but other human beings hold human beings to a different level of responsibility and accountability, depending upon how aware they are, either through education or um, it's self-evident or whatever. You probably shouldn't have to teach people around the world you know, not to rape people, not to exploit people or whatever. I imagine maybe there's some societies that that doesn't, but for most of us, it, we understand that a moral imperative. Um, but it is for sure a skill to teach human beings how to be self-aware and how to seek awareness so that I can be a better leader. Not necessarily a better firewall engineer or a better coder or whatever, mm -hmm. Um, but it's not always, in fact, I find it's usually not um, intrinsic uh, to most people who can become amazing leaders and amazing managers, uh, but they have to be taught, you know, either modeled for them or a program that they can go through. And if they find that they don't do well in it, because they don't have the emotional ability or the interest or whatever, that they can opt out with grace. A lot of times we put people in a program and there's no fail small. Yeah. You don't you don't make it through the program. We don't really have a spot for you as opposed to letting them go back to being that single contributor or that mm -hmm. systems manager. So uh, anyway, that was just me resonating to you talking about awareness. I think that the way that you can become the best leader is when people teach you how to be aware. What's the cue in the conversation that I'm in? Absolutely. And ironically, you've hit on the reason I'm a convert uh. because simply being aware that there were other stakeholders mm -hmm. that were underserved, that were underrepresented, and that the cries for emotion or for environment, the cries for diversity and leadership, the cries for societal change mm -hmm. should all be telling us mm -hmm. we have stakeholders who are underserved. Mm -hmm. And the capitalist in me says, mm -hmm. if I can serve those stakeholders better than anybody else, mm -hmm. that's profit, that's sustainability, that's returns, that's but I've got, I've literally got an invite through those cries, through those criticisms. Right. I've got an invite to make their lives better. Right. And it's fantastic. I will say, uh, to your point of in the future, do we have these things? Mm -hmm. uh, the future is now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not wearing it today uh, because that scared me. <laughs> but I actually have an Amazon Halo. Oh. 
it monitors tone, right. heart rate, all that, right. and gives me a report on my day. Mm -hmm. And it's tuned to me on what categorization of language. Was I educational? Was I condescending? Was I angry? Was I frustrated? And as a part of this effort, mm -hmm. I've been using it off and on for about a year now, thanks to a, a buddy of mine, Dave O'Hara, who recommended it to me. And I got in on the beta program and I realized it's making me a better person mm -hmm. because the worst possible experience on this had nothing to do with work. Mm -hmm. I was wearing it from work. I came home. I didn't take it off mm -hmm. and I was sitting there and I was talking to my daughter. Mm -hmm. So I've got three kids. Mm -hmm. My daughter is the middle. Um, she's a high schooler mm -hmm. and she started talking about her cheerleading team and all that. And, and I get the report at the end of the day. And during that time block, disinterested and dismissive. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, this is, this is a person I want to know right. what, being loved and cherished feels like, right. right? This is a person who I want to know is incredibly important to me, just yeah. like I want that for all of my kids. Right. Dismissive. Yeah. And it hit like a ton of bricks and I was like, okay. Yeah. It's emotionally taxing, which is why I don't wear it all the time. Right. <laughs> like you gotta like, you gotta be amped for that right. game day, right? But I typically wear it a quarter, every other quarter and then take a quarter off and right. reassess um, for the last little while. And it's made a huge difference yeah. because it gives me that. And it's a fantastic thing. And I, privacy is a myth, right? So yeah, they got the data, but I got Alexa's all over the place. They got the data anyway. Yeah. I, um, man, we don't, we've been doing this for an hour and a half. I don't, I, I go way down a rabbit hole. I love it. Let's just keep it to, I love that idea that we can develop tools and I can choose to employ them for me to be a better human being for other human beings. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that sort of, I don't know that I have a mission statement. Man, I, I want to flourish and I want the other human beings that I can help flourish to flourish. I am not ashamed to make a profit. I am not ashamed to be um, a successful version. In fact, I almost think it's, it's, it's a noble cause to be the very best, which is not, a, it's not exploitive. It's not any of these other things. And I've also found, um, it gives me, when I have margin, I am able to be generous in a way that margin of time, margin of talent, margin of money, a variety of things that I can create margin in for my family, but most especially, I love to be able to do it for people not only who can't pay me back in any of those areas, may not be particularly interested in paying me back. I could do it whether I want to do it anonymously or whatever, but I have the ability to invest and do that. And if you don't have margin uh, in some or all of those areas, you don't have a lot of opportunity to help change the trajectory of other human beings' lives. And that's why I'm really curious to learn more. And I've written down a number of the books that you've talked about. I want to go really because it's resonating with me. Um, I, I do think that, you know, helping other human beings flourish is the best way we can help our planet. I mean, whether it's in the environmental space, it's in the uh, equality space, it's in the whatever, um, how do we make our lives better and take care of each other? Which is conscious capitalism, right? The idea that we can elevate humanity. So I'll, I'll send you a link to an amazing write-up that kind of reviews all of the canonical books and those kind of things, gives links to summaries, all that fun stuff. Okay. It's got a couple of videos in it and it's basically the primer guide. If you want to dive deep and you can read it yourself, you can share it with others, the yeah. users, the listeners. Yeah, we'll put it in the links below. And, and it's, it's a great way to dive in okay. and it's, it's not evangelical. It's, there's a lot of detail to it in, this is going to be hard. Right. Like this is not the easy way to run a business. Right. Delvin, I've, I've loved it. All right, Delvin. Devlin, the first day of my new brain. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on the show. What haven't we covered today that we should have? I think we checked all the boxes. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate the invite and moving around with the tropical storm. Yeah, pretty, pretty interesting times, but we made it happen. I appreciate you coming on the show, and um, I look forward to... 
uh, maybe uh, sometime next year to catch it up and 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 have a more of a conversation on this. I really appreciate you coming in. Absolutely. All right. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. We'll have Devlin's uh, links below. Please uh, join us next time on the QTS Experience. We'll see you.